Well, hello, friends, and welcome to the Dimension of Our Midnight Cake, a weekly transmission from the Nexus of Realities. I'm Soltis, and joining me are my friends and fellow transdimensional beings, Beaches. Uh, the best take on E.T. I've heard in a while was that he looked like a cross between a sloth and a ninja turtle. <laughs> <laughs> And Lumberdor. My personal favorite scene is when he's chugging back cold ones and eating cats. So, <laughs> wasn't that Alf? <laughs> they had to be friends, right? I mean, two lonely guys from somewhere out in space. I'm sure, they crossed paths. Stranded somewhere. on this crap old planet. <laughs> Just want some candy, dang it. Give me my Reese's pieces. <laughs> Well, I'm looking forward to this. E.T. The Extraterrestrial is one of my favorite films, and the discussion should be pretty fun. So to start off, E.T. The Extraterrestrial, or simply E.T., is a 1982 American science fiction film produced and directed by Steven Spielberg and written by Melissa Matheson. It tells the story of Elliot, a boy who befriends an extraterrestrial, dubbed E.T., who is left behind on Earth. Along with his friends and family, Elliot must find a way to help E.T. find his way home. The film stars D. Wallace, Henry Thomas, Peter Coyote, Robert McNaughton, and Drew Barrymore. The film's concept was based on an imaginary friend that Spielberg created after his parents' divorce. In 1980, Spielberg met Matheson and developed a new story from the unrealized project Night Skies. In less than two months, Matheson wrote the first draft of the script titled E.T. and Me, which went through two rewrites. The project was rejected by Columbia Pictures, who doubted its commercial potential, but Universal Pictures eventually purchased the script for $1 million. The film was an immediate blockbuster, surpassing Star Wars to become the highest grossing film of all time, a record it held for 11 years until Spielberg's own Jurassic Park surpassed it in 1993. E.T. was widely acclaimed by critics and is regarded as one of the greatest films of all time. It received nine nominations at the 55th Academy Awards, winning Best Original Score, Best Visual Effects, Best Sound, and Best Sound Editing, and also won five Saturn Awards and two Golden Globe Awards. The film was released in 1985 and again in 2002 to celebrate its 20th anniversary with altered shots, visual effects, and additional scenes. It was also re-released in IMAX on August 12, 2022 to celebrate its 40th anniversary. In 1994, the film was added to the United States National Film Registry of the Library of Congress, who deemed it, quote, culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant, unquote. If you enjoy our discussion and would like to contribute or get in contact with us, consider visiting our website at OurMidnightCake.com, liking, subscribing, and sharing the transmission with your friends. We also hope that you will join us next week for our discussion of Barbarian the 2022 American horror film written and directed by Zach Kreger in his solo directorial debut. You know what? I never was a big fan of E.T. And for some reason, you know, it's Steven Spielberg and, and he's, he's pretty good at sometimes tugging on the heartstrings. And I got kind of emotional at the, toward the end of this one. And I, I couldn't figure out why until I got to looking up some of the you know, trivia and stuff about it. And I, I don't know why I didn't realize this, but uh, this is E.T.'s 40th anniversary. It is. And it's mine as well. And we're oh, both dang. still, we're both still pretty damn cool. <laughs> <laughs> you both, your necks kind of stick out a little bit. And your eyes are <laughs> don't have as much hair as you used to oh my god <laughs> you both make that noise and, ah! <laughs> when you see people one of the many interesting things about this movie is that it was filmed almost sequentially which is not oh, something really? that's wow that's done very often in film wasn't that done for the benefit of the child actors it was yes okay i thought i'd heard that to where they would have a greater emotional reaction when E.T. was leaving and everything was ending and that was the end of their journey. I've always and heard uh, Spielberg was well, really thought. good with uh, child actors, you know. Well, for this, I think the after Close Encounters of the Third Kind, he had a, a greater familiarity with child actors and uh, yeah. helping get the best performances out of them. I was very impressed 
with the whole cast. Thought they did very well. A young uh, four year what four year old Drew Barrymore. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Not quite that young, I thought. How old was she when she filmed this? Oh, I I think it was. I don't know. I'm guessing seven. Seven? No, not seven. Seven. Yeah, really? seven years old. Was wow. I right? Yeah, right. seven years old. I went well, to Barrymore. I blame it on your extensive child having experience. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because as a man, I've had all the children. <laughs> I used to wonder. It was like every couple of <laughs> every season or so. <laughs> well, <laughs> and then one comes Here down comes from the spaceship one. and wanders off and <laughs> steals all your candy. I salute Spielberg for not presenting aliens in a stereotypical light with weird space costumes and everything. He just goes naked alien. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the design of the creature of, of E.T., it's so bizarre but familiar at the same time. Italian special effects artist Carlo Rambaldi created E.T. I think it's a wonderful balance between something so odd and bizarre and foreign and something that you can relate to at the same time. So a guy named Rambaldi created the hairless alien? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Jokes write themselves. <laughs> yes, there you go. It was really interesting, too, some of the things about it, the... Uh extending neck design like where does that come from i was watching this with my kids and they were talking about some of those things mm -hmm. like they wanted to know why the heart glows and to them it looked like you know whenever the heart was glowing it looked like there was just this big hole in the chest like this open chest cavity it does make him look kind of hollow doesn't it yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yes and <laughs> It's like, I don't know. That's that's just how he is. I, I don't know. That's, that's a, a trait of his species, I guess. But he also, when he's when he's extended like that in the shape of his head, he kind of looks like there might be a, a Johnny Five underneath. It does, yes. <laughs> yes. It's like if Johnny Five had advanced enough to uh, have their own planet and decided to have skin. <laughs> Yeah, but there there were a, there were a whole team of you know, puppeteers, and um, I think it was four different heads created for oh. the filming. One main animatronic, and then and then others for specific facial expressions, as well as the costume to be worn by actors. Was this was you know, was ILM involved in this? ILM, yes, yes, yeah, ILM course. was. Okay, all right, and this it was, shows the effects are still hold up pretty well, I think. Oh, yeah. yeah, Solid puppetry. One thing I always liked about E.T., and it's probably just from my love of penguins, is that he, <laughs> he, was, <laughs> yeah. he was, you know, about the size of an emperor penguin. And he made all these weird squawky noises before he started talking. And he had this you nice gotta wonder water. if that wasn't some of the basis for yeah. <laughs> the his design. feet, too. Like when Drew Barrymore is talking about his feet and they do the close up of the little like web toes and that's <laughs> no, it's great Which, yeah, it's yeah you know distinct waddle that it has as it's yes. you know, scuttling along <laughs> this is going to lead to something i was maybe thinking of saving for later but um you know when he's fleeing from the uh the men in the forest he moves a lot faster than you mm -hmm. would think he'd be able to yeah mm -hmm. but also also this time around i thought of um a kind of a story breaking thing uh Soltis, we discussed this Yes. previously mm -hmm. <laughs> et can fly or at least he can cause himself to levitate which i it amounts to flying right <laughs> why doesn't he just fly to his ship <laughs> okay he's not trying to hide anymore he's just trying to escape <laughs> if he just flown he probably would have made it and now et is ruined i'm sorry <laughs> so the movie can happen <laughs> <laughs> so the movie can happen God, I hate that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's because puppeteers are constantly attached to him as well. <laughs> no, 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 no. That can't be it. This is... That's ridiculous. <laughs> okay. <You're right. laughs> Come on, E.T., hey, levitate yourself. Oh, and uh, you were talking about the Reese's Pieces earlier, and apparently they originally wanted to use M&M's, but uh, Mars refused to allow M and M's to be used because they thought oh, that ET would man. would frighten children. So they asked Hershey's if they could use Reese's, and they agreed. And 
as a result, Reese's Pieces all the way, man. I love yeah. Reese's Pieces. And as a result, the sales skyrocketed. M and M's didn't care because they were still on top. Because they were still M and M's. But he kept Reese's regardless. Pieces alive for the rest of us. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the voice of ET. The bulk of the voice was performed by Pat Welsh. She smoked two packs of cigarettes a day, which gave her voice a quality that sound effects creator Ben Burt really enjoyed. And he spent <laughs> nine and a half hours recording her part. She was paid $380. She spent it all on cigarettes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. that. That's, that's what, a carton of cigarettes now? <laughs> Burt also recorded 16 other people and various animals to create E.T.'s voice, um, including Spielberg, actress Deborah Winger, his sleeping wife who was sick with a cold, a burp from his USC film professor, raccoons, otters, and horses. <laughs> they combine them and layer them into all the different noises that ET makes. It reminds me of that interview with the guy that uh, did the sound, the Seinfeld theme song, and he's like playing on his keyboard and making all these weird sound effects and recording them. Oh, yeah. Um, I believe it was you, Lumberdor, who mentioned that he also did that for every episode. It wasn't just a, a one track that he recorded, but he I would... think so, yeah. If I remember correctly from that interview I watched with him. Yeah, it was to match the timing of his little opening act for each one. But that is wonderful dedication and something that I fear that the modern age has ruined. You know, they, they had all these problems that they had to solve realistically to be able to present it yeah. on film. But realistically, if you've ever had children, you could honestly just record them any of their voices from like three months to like six years and get a lot of alien noises <laughs> as well. If you don't have any technology of your own, that's oh, fancy. yes. You want to engineer your own sounds effects. You yes. can <laughs> definitely do that. Of course, there's the wonderful soundtrack from John Williams. Specifically, the music for the big bike chase scene. Spielberg apparently loved that so much that he edited the sequence to fit the, specifically the, the music the that music. Williams had created. So E.T.'s got a set of powers. Telekinetic, obviously. He's mm -hmm. also some... able to make things like heal. He's like... Yes, he got some sort of he's healing. He's a healer. Apparently not for himself. It's not like a Wolverine healing factor, yeah. but uh, no, it's more like a, a a projected healing factor. And even the scenes too with um, uh, Elliot in school, or more like of like was... his, because he seems to have an empathic ability. I, I think part of that's yes. his connection to things, probably. So that <laughs> could be like just that and him connecting to other life. But definitely empathic. And this time watching through, there are several things when you're a kid that just fly over your head. Mostly that thing the bullies at trucks. school have taken from you, they keep throwing back and forth and you just can't get. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like for some reason, when I was younger too, I remember thinking that the his brother was a lot older than he was just because like the opening scene with because kids, Because when you were watching it, when you were younger, the brother was so much older than you. Yes. But there's but there's a lot of that that just went over my head when I was very young, you know, didn't understand all the situations. But one of those things was how quickly the connection between E.T. and Elliot is formed. It's uh -huh. it's almost immediate. Yeah, they, I got a thing to meet. say about that, those connections. Mm -hmm. So like I said, I was not a huge fan of E.T. in my youth. And for some reason, I think up until I probably watched the remake version with the uh, the walkies instead of the guns and all that came oh, out. Oh, yes. The remaster, whatever you want to call it, with the, yeah, the, the CGI the ET. anniversary version yeah. in 2002. I probably oh, watched, I forgot about that. I probably watched it again out of circulation sometime now. around <laughs> then. And, uh, well, I was afraid when I went to rent it, it might be that version instead of mm -hmm. the original. I had an idea... <laughs> For the longest time, that the the keychain guy, yeah, mm -hmm. was the dad. <laughs> I did too, actually. I, really? I did too. Yeah. Oh, yes. really? Yes. Oh, I well, I did not have that. I don't know why, but I I thought the same. That's so odd. <laughs> yeah. On that with the keychain guy, the mom is the only face of the adult that you see throughout the first half of the movie. Mm. All of the government agents and the teacher and. You don't see their heads, or if you see their heads, you don't see their faces. They could be anybody. It's you know, there's a lot of really well planned 
shots throughout though just you oh know, yeah cinematography is excellent just like you're talking about we're calling him the keychain guy because you identify him as by his keys oh they really so hammer that home yeah <laughs> yes that, that's that is his defining characteristic is the it's keys. keychain <laughs> until <yeah. laughs> even when yeah. he's zipping up his little hazmat suit there's the keychain <laughs> yeah <laughs> It's something that you can recognize and you can latch on to for that character. Uh, you're right. I didn't even through. think about that, but it is sort of like a, a sort of a peanuts kind of thing where you, the, the, all those guys, they're just like mm-hmm. maybe waist up, waist down mm-hmm. uh, up to a certain point in the movie. You know, you only see the hand reaching down to pick up the Reese's pieces or the back of him as he's and eating them. Yes. Yeah, yes. He them. ate them. Yeah. Uh, it's delicious forest floor Reese's pieces. <laughs> No one's around and dibs. I got some <laughs> leprechauns left these out for me. <laughs> Do you think they? Yes, he really. They, ate them. they had an idea what they were hunting for. I believe so. Like a vague notion. Okay, well, I did, especially after well, they didn't, saw did the they, spaceship. Now I don't remember. They did. Okay, so they did. Yeah, they okay. saw it. Mm-hmm. That was one of those things, also that seemed to be a heavy theme throughout and I, normally i don't enjoy talking about themes in movies of the government hunting something down being able to disregard to an entire civil rights conversations yeah <laughs> yeah yes. we'll just wait till they're out and then break in and <laughs> yep <laughs> and we'll... i really like the shot of the i, I don't, it was an extension cord maybe or something just tugging and tugging and tugging until it slammed the chair against the wall i don't know why mm-hmm. i just that just uh, amused me. It's a wonderful device for tension, mm. which, you know, it, it doesn't have anything to do with the story. Nothing. As a shot, it, the feelings of intrusion and invasion of personal space and... Well, I love how we get lighting. this sort of, this extremely, you know, lived in, homey, you know, suburban house here turns mm. into like a, an alien world, <laughs> almost yeah. with yes, the flashlights. Yeah. The, the it gets it's all shot. X-Files. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's one thing that always, like, even when I was little, I remember it stood out to me was that initial scene with where he's brought E.T. up to his bedroom and the lighting in that scene. At first, like, the mom is checking on him and he's sick and whatever, but then it's, like, intentionally dark, like the blinds are pulled and the sh- the light's coming in and it's, you know, certain angles with E.T. being the same height as the table with all the stuff everywhere and he's introducing all his Star Wars characters to him and all that stuff you know it's again good cinematography but oh, the, the blocking and the, the way that yeah, everything is framed a lot is... of the times you don't even you would just get a shot of the room whatever lighting oh we really want to show this character you know you wouldn't go to that much trouble to purposely hide it and I You're just, right. it's even even as a young person, I, I like I, I noticed that, you know, that is like, why is this character so hidden? And normally with establishing shots, that's all it is, is just, OK, here's the room. Yeah, this is where they are. Get them in there. Do the action. Because I know, think I think it like at that time when I was I remember it bugging me that well, I want to see this alien. You know, I didn't appreciate oh. why. And it's like. <laughs> why can't they just show me this alien instead of all these horrible camera shots where he's hiding behind the table and all this stuff? <laughs> you know, I didn't appreciate it then, but it, it had purpose yeah. behind it. But <laughs> oh, Yeah, it, it, it definitely lets your imagination wander. But like I said, I, I saw this with my kids and, and the, one of my favorite scenes, of course, is when Elliot is camping outside and he's sleeping in the chair and he's oh, just yeah. waiting up for this creature to come back. And then he goes through the cornfield next to his house. He knows that something's there. And then he finds a ET and the, <laughs> he's absolutely horrified. <laughs> of course, then you get the weird sounds and, and hand motions from yeah. the creature. And uh, and it freaked my kids out. I, I, it freaked me out when I was a kid. But it oh, that them scream out. is very specific. If I heard that coming out of something else, I would know that was ET. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> like it, it's become so iconic, but it was so much fun to watch them watch the scene, react to it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> After that, they were hooked into. I mean, yeah. they thought that it was very cool up until then, but after that, they wanted to know about this creature and what happens to it in the story and, and everything. My, my boys, they didn't learn about ET from the movie 
actually they learned about him through lego dimensions and so like i bought i got the lego dimension set with the the character you know and they played oh my god et2 because i remember when we saw the goonies they were like oh this is the thing from a lego (laughs) yes yeah and so they learned about these you know these movies we grew up on through legos but then it got them really interested in in movies from like when i was a kid because they learned about kind of about the world before actually seeing the the story and the content of, as to what made it, which was kind of interesting. That's interesting. That's I, I find that very interesting. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, I wouldn't have thought that something like like Lego Dimensions would be a gateway to wonderful cinematography yeah. for for children. Yeah. Well, why I keep referencing another movie, but it, uh, the Goonies was something I. I knew we'd enjoy, but I wasn't mm-hmm. certain they would. And it yeah. seemed like the Lego connection sort of heightened their interest it in it. Yeah, it did. It's because, I mean, they were already familiar with it, you know, in yeah, some yeah. way. they It, it was like, like they had made a movie of the Lego game. <laughs> yeah, it, was, it wasn't just like, we don't want to watch this stupid movie that you used to like when you were little. We don't care. It's like, oh, we have this Lego connection. Let's see what this is about. <laughs> oh, oh. that's that's both inspiring and sad at the same time <laughs> yes that is life yeah. <laughs> one thing i always like about uh like the we were talking earlier about the special effects but it i think et is one of the ones too that's known for like they didn't take care of some of it after the like the props after the movie and it's got one of the more horrifying oh. like aging of is like, there one of those gross rubber ETs out there? With yeah, holes? somewhere that's <laughs> like it's like falling apart and just like it's eyes like more popped than... out. And... Yeah, <laughs> that's sad. So ET seems to confirm his own existence in the Star Wars universe, which is further confirmed by what was it? Uh, Attack of the Clones. Attack of the Clones. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did you know that Lumberdor? I did not. What was there? Are ETs in, in Attack of the Clones? Really? Yeah. Where they are? It's during the Senate scene of the. Galactic Do you remember Senate. all those little, all those little flying CD things that? Yeah, the pods. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. don't know. Yeah, the little pod. Yeah, yeah. They, there's a one of them with a couple of. I don't know what to call them other than ETs. ETs. <laughs> like, like you know, like the predators are called like Yaucha. I think. Do the ET have a species name? They do. <laughs> Do we want to know it? <laughs> Asogian. They are Asogian. Asogians. That's awful. <laughs> I'm never going to remember that. Asogians were paddle-footed, large-eyed sentients indigenous to Brodo Asogi. During the last decades of the Galactic Republic, the Asogians were represented in the Galactic Senate by Senator Greplepis and a trio of eights. <laughs> When the Republic became the Galactic Empire, oh, the conclusion of, of the Clone course, Wars. Of course, this is a Star Wars backstory. <laughs> Reb Lepis, yeah. yeah, was charged with treason, and the Asogians' home planet became a part of the autocratic new government. <laughs> they were conquered so, by the Empire. <laughs> so was E.T.'s ship trying to get away from the Empire then, when he got stranded on Earth? Well, no, no, that was, remember, Star Wars is a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Yeah, but it connects somewhere. <laughs> I like when directors put little nods like that to other stuff and not necessarily necessarily make it. Do you guys see the, the story the, or the R two D two in Star Trek two thousand nine? Yes, I remember that because it was in, when they were in hyperspace. When, when, when they show up to Vulcan, where all the wreckage is, as they're flying through R two D two, just sort of zooms past the ship. <laughs> it's fantastic. <laughs> That right there is my favorite moment in Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> well, you offended multiple universes all at once. <laughs> Thank you for joining us in the dimension of our Midnight Cape. We hope you'll visit us again. From myself, Lumberdor, Beaches, and Doug. Thank you, and good night.
So you're trying to show a kid Star Wars and they're treating it like uh, maybe maybe uh, when you saw like Lost in Space or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and by Lost in Space, I mean I mean the black and white series. Oh, I, I do yes. have yeah. something like that. My, uh, my family loved I Love Lucy, but I hated uh-huh. it because it wasn't Charlie Brown. <laughs> you just specifically hated this because it wasn't what you wanted to watch yes, yes. <laughs> well, well, no, 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 no 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 because because uh the only character for, of lucy that i was familiar with was from the peanuts ah. from so it wasn't it wasn't a charlie brown thing and I, I this understand. isn't the real lucy <laughs> yeah this isn't lucy yes. this is what is this <laughs> i'm gonna watch marshall brave star <laughs> instead Yes, this person who practically helped invent television. <laughs> yes, right. Yes, yeah. yeah. The the cultural significance of I Love Lucy was completely lost on me as a, you know when I was three years old. <laughs> oh, Four years old. And now we're seeing the literal downfall of television. <laughs> oh yes. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Disney. <laughs> <laughs>